Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. It's a great honor to be able to present at ATIPI's 60th anniversary. Uh, so let's begin. I'm here to talk a little bit about an ancient kingdom that once ruled over a vast territory, maintaining social, political, and economic stability for over 600 years. Moreover, I'll be speaking about the writing system that they have, which, although no longer in use, is of great importance for the descendants of these ancient rulers, and is going through a process of revival. This is the story of the Ahom Kingdom and of the typographic implementation of the Thai Ahom script. The Ahom Kingdom was located in the northeast frontier of the Indian subcontinent, in what is now known as the state of Assam. It was established during the 13th century when the descendants of the Shans or Ts of Southeast Asia traveled south following the Luhit River until they reached the Brahmaputra Valley. Once there, they fell in love with the place. However, there was a tiny bit of a problem since the place was already being occupied. So they quickly conquered the local inhabitants and they established their own kingdom. The Ahoms spent the following two centuries consolidating their power and expanding their domains. At its peak, during the 17th century, the Ahom kingdom reached from Sadija to the east to Gohati in the west. The last couple of centuries of the Ahom kingdom history are a very interesting period of time because they're filled with political dissensions, social and warlike conflicts, and so on and so forth. In 1817, the Burmese invaded the country, and they achieved complete domination by 1822. And then the British did what they do best. They crashed the party uninvited. <laughs> and they also got scared. They got scared of the Burmese eventually knocking on the door in Bengal. So the first Anglo-Burmese war took place. And by the end of this first Anglo-Burmese war, the British basically left the control and administration of the Ahom Kingdom to the local king. They said, hey, you know what, mate? We have no quarrel with you. As long as you know who's in charge, you can keep your kingdom. But soon after, a second Anglo-Burmese war took place. And by the end of this second Anglo-Burmese war, sorry about that, uh, things changed. The British basically said, you know, you kind of screw things up, so we're taking your kingdom away from you. And the Ahom Kingdom was no more. Even when the Ahom Kingdom lasted over 600 years, the Thai Ahom writing system did not. For the first couple of centuries, the Ahoms maintained their own religion and script. However, in spite of being mighty warriors and fearless conquerors, they were kind and understanding rulers. They allowed for the conquered people to keep their own religion and writing system, which in the end turned out to be detrimental for their own Ahoms. Why? Well, because the Ahoms were single and they were ready to mingle. And they did. So soon, um, social intercourse between the ruling race and the non-ruling race was a common thing. To the point where the Ahoms began not only professing the Hindu faith and traditions, but also using the SMS writing system and speech. At this point, both the writing system and the speech got relegated to the religious sphere from which its survival as a spoken language was no longer possible. From the very early stages of its demise, there have been several attempts to both um, revive and save the Tayakum writing system. Two of the most important ones are the Var Amra lexicon, which are a series of manuscripts written during the late 18th century, and the Ahom SMS English Dictionary which is the first publication to showcase a typography, a typeface, specifically designed for the Thai Ahom writing system. But the cultural revival movement gained strength during the 1960s, when a group of very influential people of Ahom descent gathered together to foster several cultural aspects of the Ahom community. They did this in order to make a proper petition to the Indian Prime Minister so that the two upper districts of the state of Assam could be considered as a different, a separate Ahom entity. They did it, and they got rejected. So they tried it again. During the 1970s, they continued working on building a case and making an appeal. They did it, and they got rejected once again. During the 1980s, the Ahom community began participating in communal forums alongside the SMS community and some other cultural groups. However, the gathering of these several groups changed how things were done and how things were viewed, 
So instead of discussing, okay, how can we do this? How can we change the mind of the Indian prime minister? How can we convince Indian's government to do what we want? They started to think, how can we force the Indian government to do what we want? So a more radical version of the future was being envisioned. And the Alpha was born, the Unified Liberation Front of Assam, which was, and to a certain degree, still is a guerrilla group. So got things, things got tricky. By the 1990s, even after the rapid loss of power of the Alpha, nothing has, had been defined about the Ahom situation. Nowadays, there are several very important projects that help and wish to aid the Ahom cultural revival movement. The most important of them all is the one being led by Dr. Stephen Morey. He and his team are photographing, transcribing, and translating all the pages of all the copies of the Var Amra lexicons that they can find. This with the intention to develop a mobile application that will serve as a dictionary. Additionally, the inclusion of the Tayakum writing system in the 2015's Unicode standard was a great thing. I could finally say, hey, I'm working on a script that actually exists. Okay, whenever we are talking about the Tayakum writing system, it's important to notice that the state of Assam has a great manuscript tradition. Within this territory, the written word played a larger role than the spoken word, and the same is true for the Ahom kingdom. There's a large body of manuscripts, original manuscripts, that still survive till this day. Most of these manuscripts are held within private collections, with a lot of them being held inside the houses of the members of the Yakum priestly case, and some of them, very few, held within uh, several museums. All of these manuscripts are written on the bark of this tree, which I'm not even gonna try to pronounce, but it's locally known as the Sansi tree. The bark has to be cut and treated before it can be used as a writing system. Another very inter interesting thing about the writing system and the calligraphic tradition of the Yakum script is that there's evidence of both the use of a stylus as a writing tool, as well as a reed pen. So you have conventions for both a monoline imprint and a modulated one. The script is a descendant of Brahmi, so it's an alpha syllabary, meaning that a base consonant is written alongside one or multiple uh, inherent vowels. These, the combination of these elements form monosyllabic words, which in this case, can contain up to five elements. Originally, the script had no interword breaks, and the modern interpretation of the Akham script had changed a little bit. It now has 24 initial and final consonants, three medial consonants, 12 inherent vowels, uh, 12 numerals, and four punctuation marks. Another very interesting thing is that the script does not convey tone. So one word can have several meanings. In this specific case, there have been 17 identified meanings for this word. Whenever we try to approach the typographic renditions of the Tayakum script, it's important to say that there aren't many. The first one ever done was the one uh, published in the 1920s book, the Ahom and Asame's English Dictionary, which probably was commissioned as a way to aid the cultural revival movement. Oh, sorry, I'm moving too fast. This model became the authoritative model just by simple repetition, since all of the early chief publications that treated or approached the Ahom subject used this, this model. More modern models have purposely deviated from the model of the 1920s book. And in this case, the 1992's uh, Tayahom font used in the publication Tayahom and the Star's Three Rituals to Guard Yourself of Danger, the authors specifically say that they are following more closely calligraphic traditions. However, none of these two main typographic renditions address correctly the typographic needs of the script. The first one, the combination between a base consonant and an inherent vowel, in most cases do, doesn't produce a ligature when it should. And on the other hand, the 1992's rendition has very little concern and takes little work in order to take care of typographic conventions like texture, color, and rhythm. So I decided to make my own proposition. 
And the first thing to do whenever you're trying to approach any kind of non-Latin script is to get familiar with it and find as much of vernacular renditions of the script, not only manuscripts, but also, in this case, coinage. Additionally, some calligraphic exercises using the correct pen with the correct angle and everything is very useful. The Achon manuscript that they, it's held within the British Library served as the primary source of inspiration. Okay. However, handwriting and calligraphy is not the same as typography. And things change. Even when the intention is to typographically recreate the appearance of any handwritten text, there are things that you have to consider. Conventions, typographic conventions, like texture, color, and rhythm. The process of translating and taking one thing, one script, from one environment, one context, meaning the handwritten or calligraphic context, and translating to another one, the typographic context, with all the limitants and constraints that this implies, is called by Jerry typographicization. So if you have a problem with the word, take it with him. It took me forever to actually kind of pronounce it, you know, properly. So, as I was saying, most of the spontaneous nature of the writing hand gets lost in translation, or at least modified. And it's instead replaced by specific typographic precepts, like character repertoire, dimensions, mark positioning, and fitting. Defining the character repertoire is one of the most important things that you have to do. In the case of the Tyachum script, it was a fairly simple thing to do, since the character repertoire is quite small and not as big as compared with other non-Latin writing systems. However, since the combination of a base consonant and an inherent vowel in most cases forms a ligature, special, special considerations should be taken into account on how many ligatures we have to develop. Additionally, if we treat the Achum script as a living script, which would certainly serve the agenda of the cultural revival movement, we should take into account words and combination of characters that do not naturally occur uh, within their manuscript tradition. This to give space for borrow words and neologisms. Dimensions. Horizontal dimensions are no longer a problem thanks to the technological advancements in type design software. However, vertical dimensions are, since there are certain combinations of characters that either push the ascender line too high or they push the descender line too low. So as a typeface designer, you have to make decisions. Are you, are you going to allow these combinations to happen? Are you going to leave enough space between uh, one line of text and the other so to avoid clashes? Mark positioning. Within the diagram script, the inherent vowels and diacritical marks can appear above the base consonant as an exit stroke of the base consonant to the left or to the right of the base consonant. And things like alignment, width, and space between several combinations of these characters are very important to consider. And finally, fitting. Since the combination of these two or more characters can happen as an exit stroke between a straight stroke and a round stroke, between two round stroke and so on and so forth, it's very important to consider how these how these elements relate to one another and how they are changing the texture within a paragraph of text. Also, there are certain combinations that have to be changed since the width of the characters changed. And finally, harmonization and Latinization. Whenever you're designing a multi-script tie family, there's, it's expected that both or the whole amount of scripts that you're designing should have a certain degree of familiarity. However, this degree of familiarity, there's not a consensus or a common agreement of how much things should look like or how much things, you know, like texture, color, and things like that. And even when I'm, I'm conscious about it and I'm, I was consciously trying to avoid Latinization, I know I screwed the pooch in several aspects. This happens because it's, it's very easy to let the dominant script, meaning the one that you're most familiar with, uh, dictate the decisions that you're taking on the secondary or third and so on and so forth scripts that you're trying to approach. In my case, uh, proportions are a big problem and I know I have to work a lot on this. Okay, 
And just to close things up, why am I telling you this and why I spent pretty much half of the lecture talking about the story of the Ahom Kingdom? Well, because type phase design do, does not exist within a bubble isolated from everything. Type phase design exists within a pool of contextual meaning, social context, historical context, cultural context. And all of these contexts should serve us as type phase designers um, as a way to make well-informed decisions. I know that there's a lot of work and I know that I screwed things up in this uh, typographic conditions, even when I'm trying, consciously trying to address the typographic needs of the script. But the typographic refinement of the Tayakum writing system can only stem from continuous design efforts. Typography does not only serve as a tool for mainstream textual communication, but also as a way for language preservation. The spoken language of a kingdom that lasted over 600 years might never be heard again. But the writing system that serves as a way for a whole community to identify themselves is sure as hell worth preserving. Thank you so much. <laughs>